so we'll get started. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining. We've got a, a well over 200 um, participants who, who signed on and registered. Um, so thank you so much for, for doing that. A special thanks uh, to uh, CORD supporters who helped, um, uh, in part, make this webinar happen. And we want to uh, give a special shout out to, to Hoffman, Hoffman LaRoche, um, Jansen, and AstraZeneca. So, so thank you for that. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the CORD and 360 teams who put in uh, a, a ton of work offline to, to bring this together, to make the slides um, work. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the panelists that you're going to hear from, these things don't just uh, come together. Uh, they come together quickly, but with a lot of work in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the back shop. So uh, a special thanks to you and your teams for, for making this happen. And finally, I want to thank everyone who uh, has signed on to this webinar today. Um, a lot of you probably took part in the uh, webinars earlier this spring, um, and the numbers continue to grow. Uh, we had over 255 registrants for today, and I see the, the number of attendees um, on this one just, just uh, going through the roof. So um, I think that's a testament to how important this subject and this issue is. It's getting parliamentary attention. It's, it's very... Um, uh, active on, on social media and, and regular media in, in the last couple of days. So um, this is an opportunity to, uh, to, to dig in a little bit deeper, uh, to, to look under the hood of, of what these changes may mean and may not mean and, and ask yourselves the question, okay, what do we see? Um, how have they evolved and, and are they changing? Just a couple of uh, logistical uh, issues for, for the GoToWebinar. Use the, use the Q&As panel. You'll see the questions panel there. Um, to ask questions throughout uh, this. We will uh, do our best to collate some of them and bring them together and bring them forward um, as they come along. And the same thing with, with the chat uh, panel as well. If, if your colleagues or friends or others have missed this webinar, we are going to be posting it on CORE's YouTube channel uh, and, on, uh, and on SlideShare. So um, you can always watch it um, offline um, starting as early as tomorrow. Uh, so just uh, really quickly, my name is, I should have said that first, my name is Bill Dempster with 360 Public Affairs, um, a longtime uh, a partner of, of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, uh, and I've had the, the great pleasure and honor to, to help uh, moderate live panels with CORD over, over the years. And really, during COVID, uh, we've managed to take this into the virtual world, I think, with a lot of success. So. Um, it's been great to grow into that with, with, with you, Durhan, and, and the team, uh, Angela and Hillary and others at Accord. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce the, the, the panel and, and today's approach. Um, as I said earlier, we won't have many slides, and we want this to be more of a roundtable discussion than a presentation. Uh, however, we do need, need to ground it in a little bit of context and some specific um, uh, you know, drill down on, on the new guidelines. What do they mean? And so with that, we're going to start uh, with, with uh, Durhan Wang Rieger, the, the, the president and CEO of CORD, um, who is going to begin with a short recap of what we heard in the spring and some of the key recommendations that, that came forward from uh, the rare disease community and other, others who participated in, in those webinars. What were some of the key takeaways there? Um, Neil Palmer, uh, a former uh, senior official within the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board itself, uh, back in the early days of the PMPRB, but, but since then, uh, you know, a, a very well-regarded expert in everything pricing uh, and reimbursement related, and he's actually been on CORD webinars in the past, past, so we're just thrilled to have Neil to help explain the guidelines and some of the key changes and what they might mean for patients with rare disorders and other Canadians who, who really depend on transformative therapies. We then have three... Um, three roundtable participants uh, who will contribute their perspectives as we enter the Q's and A's. Uh, and just to, to explain, they're, they're, they're listed here, but we've got um, Stephanie Stavros. And Stephanie, I've just got to know you um, better with every week that passes. Uh, it's been so um, incredible what, the, what the, your advocacy group, the CF Get Loud Canada, has managed to do um, in order to, uh, to, to bring forward some of your issues around uh, access to medicines in Canada. So you've got a personal story there and, and, and some of your experience through, through the CF Get Loud um, campaign and efforts. Um, Jason Field, uh, he's 
heads an organization called Life Sciences Ontario, has been uh, an active um, contributor to CORD in terms of uh, panels and, and, and other things over, over, uh, over many years now. Um, and the great news is Jason and, and Life Sciences Ontario have actually launched new data around um, what, what Canadians are getting access to in terms of new medicines um, compared to other jurisdictions and trends over time. So hopefully we'll hear a little bit about that. Um, and finally, uh, Bennett Lee, and not finally, we might have a surprise guest jump on, but Bennett Lee, head of market access for, for Sanofi Genzyme Canada, will give his perspectives on the guidelines, drawing on some experiences uh, from the developer uh, developer of, of rare disease therapies and, and other, <coughs> other organizations. So our surprise guest, uh, we're hoping uh, would be Dr. Anil Khan, and he's a, an expert in, in uh, metabolic disorders and, uh, and a clinician, a researcher, and many people on the line might know Dr. Khan already, but um, hoping that he'll be able to step away from clinic and, and, and jump on, so we might have, um, have him join us. So with that, Durhan, I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, do a recap, and, and uh, why are we doing this now in the summer? Over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bill, and thanks for your entire team for helping to put this together. And again, my uh, I echo my thanks to the panelists because I know it's been a busy week for every one of you and everybody drilling down to uh, come to understanding kind of what these <laughs> revised guidelines might be about. Um, we wanted to do this right off the bat because, quite frankly, as you know, we got the guidelines last Friday and we only have 30 days to respond to them. So we thought it was really important to get out as soon as possible, begin to do some consultations ourselves, hopefully to be able to share perspectives and also energize everybody to, to respond to them as well. As Bill said, uh, CORE did a series starting last April in response to the uh, guidelines that were put out last December and really wanted to bring to the forefront again, what were the concerns we had with those? What is it we anticipated or hope to see in the revised guidelines that would give us any sense that, okay, we're moving forward together in the right direction? Um, very importantly, what we had felt was missed in many of the consultations was the impact on patients. And so we spent a, a whole session bringing patient, uh, patient voices together, patient examples together, patients on the panel together to really talk about what it meant for them in terms of having access to new medicines and the concerns that the draft guidelines that have been put out last December were a, a barrier. And some of them already knew it was a barrier because they have been told so, they have been given information that it was going to be delayed. So this is a, this was the opportunity. And we heard loud and clear from the patients there in terms of what they felt. And again, it reinforced, I think, what we all hope is actually the driving force here. What are we doing all this for anyway? To make sure that patients who need medicines can get access to medicines at the right time and that we can bring them into our patients at the same time as we're getting them in, in the rest of the world. So this is really important and obviously to make sure that they are affordable and sustainable, but at the forefront of all of that has got to be how do we get them to patients and that means everybody working together. What we then did was a pivot over to understanding what the impact of those guidelines were for the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, as some of you will know, I had sat on the um, steering committee to develop the first set of draft guidelines. And what we heard over and over again was, no, it doesn't make any difference. Prices have nothing to do with whether drugs are going to get launched tonight. Of course, the drugs will come to Canada, you know, no problem. And I think there was a pure willingness to ignore the real factors that companies have to take into consideration when they're bringing a drug to market, and more importantly, what our Canadian affiliates have to go through in terms of getting a drug to Canada. We're not big. We're a small part of the market. We're not necessarily seen as the very best in terms of getting it through rapidly. So what do you have to do in order to make sure that Canadians can get access, that our patients get clinical trials, that our patients get access to the therapies as soon as possible? And yes, of course, to make sure that they're going to be affordable within the Canadian system. And sometimes that's a bit of a sell, you know, back into your national. So we had a great opportunity to hear from one of the industry representatives there talking about what the challenges are. How does that, how does it actually work within the industry? 
And of course, we heard from the researchers, clinicians who say, what does it mean for us to have that investment? Why is it really important that Canada is seen as a leading country in terms of support for innovative medicines? Because we want the access to clinical trials. We want the research and development monies it brings in. And more importantly, as our researcher, Dr. Campbell says, he says, it breaks my heart every single day I go in. And I look at and I say, this is a patient who I'd like to get into a clinical trial. The clinical trials available elsewhere is not here in Canada. This is a real problem for us, but certainly something that we feel you know, needs to continue to be addressed, even as we're looking at these um, uh, guidelines. This is a driving question. And finally, in the last session that we did, we wanted to come back to, and we heard over and over again, you know, this is the best approach. Well, we don't know what the best approach is because we have not looked at alternative approaches. And again, you know, as a steering committee member, I can tell you, we were told right from the bat, your mandate is not to look at alternative approaches. Your mandate is to comment on what we're giving you. This is the approach. You tell us what it might impact. You tell us what you like or not. Tell us how we can nuance this, but do not consider alternatives. But then, of course, we hear the feedback from the, you know, PMB says, well, you didn't come up with any alternatives. Well, like, duh, we weren't asked to give any alternatives. And when we tried to put alternatives on there, we were told clearly that's not your mandate. Even the technical working group that was put together to to, rep, to talk about and to validate their approach, which they did not do, we're told, do not look at alternative methods. Tell us whether this works or not, whether you like it, whether you can validate. So we wanted to have that panel. We were really lucky to have the Office of Health Economics in the UK, who had just done a review in terms of the Canadian context and one particular part of it, and that was the ICER. Can you have a single point ICER the way that the draft guidelines had said? And was that going to be a val valuable way and a legitimate way of trying to determine what a quote non-excessive pricing was? And there were some great comments that um, the committee, I mean, that their working group had, had put their team had put together in terms of the white paper, which is available on our website as well. And it was very clear. This is not an approach that's not only not endorsed, it actually isn't workable. And it's something that others have considered but have abandoned. So this is important. And yes, there are alternatives. And these alternatives, quite interesting enough, are known to us as well. And I think more and more we see alternatives coming. And for us as well, the bigger challenge is as we're moving into the more innovative medicines, are we going to be saddled with a set of regulations and guidelines that are not only not working for today's medicine, but are going to really hamper us getting access to the innovative medicines that are going to be the, at the forefront as we move into this next generation of therapies. Okay, so that was our take up. We had a very few recommendations, which I won't belabor. Um, the first one, of course, is let's look at the impact of the pricing policies. And what we were really concerned about is what it, the PMPB had not done was as they put out their policies, they did not case test them. They did not test them against reality. And so they were putting them out there, but quite frankly, even as a committee, and we brought forth, you know, case studies and we asked them to do case studies, it was very clear what you're proposing as policies would actually decimate the Canadian you know, market. There would be no incentive for anybody to come in. They rejected that, but one of our questions is, did you pay attention? Did you look at the case studies? Have you generated case studies? And are you going to be able to revise your guidelines so that, in fact, not only were the case studies we put in front of you going to be able to be reconciled, but what about into the future? So we were really dismayed that they had not tested this against reality before they put out the policies and very elaborate and complex uh, algorithms for pricing. Second point that came out very clearly among everybody was, good gosh, you know, you don't have to be a punitive body. Yes, you're there to, you know, make sure we don't have excessive pricing. But what had was introduced in their new regulations and guidelines was they became more of the police. And this was something that was going to also be culturally and as an attitude, making it very difficult for companies to want to come in. Who wants to come in knowing that you're going to have to do battle? You know, who needs to come in realizing that whatever you're going to put forth is going to get trampled down and you're going to have to jump through hoops to come up with something that is workable within. Um, from a stake, from patient's point of view, from the researcher clinician point of view, from the payer's point of view, can we not sit down together? Interesting enough, I was on a, listening to a webinar this morning from Arcuvia talking about HTA and payers in the, you know, post-COVID. And the big thing that came out of it couple big things, but one of the big things that came out of it is in the post-COVID era, HTA and payers, health technology assessors and payers should sit down at the table together. We should be going forth with collaborative decisions. We should not be doing it as a combat. And I said, 
I mean, we're learning this from COVID, right? We're not going to develop new treatments and develop new vaccines. If we treat each other as enemies, we have to do this together. And this was what the call was for, work collaboratively, harmonize the uh, pricing, um, uh, the price setting models, but also sit down together. And this is something we're pleading for. And finally, one of the big recommendations is, okay, we want to have a 20% reduction in the, you know, in the uh, list pricing. This is something with the new 11 countries. Can we not start with that? And do we not set aside those economic factors? Yes, you've kind of managed to put them into the regulations, but there's nothing that says they have to be implemented right away. Can we not come up with something that, you know, would allow us to get forward, go forward without being saddled with the additional complications of these economic matters, uh, uh, models, especially when they're not worked out, especially when they haven't even been test case, uh, 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 you know, tested against, uh, you know, models as well, uh, real potential drugs as well as in the real market. Uh, I mean, I think that well, I'll leave it at there. Um, one of the things that, as we say, is we wanted to know is, does it really, have they done that? Have they listened? You know, because we know the majority of the uh, comments were really to ask for, for listening. So next slide, Bill, and I'll just end on this. So there's context, we have new draft guidelines, there have been some changes. Uh, will the patients be benefited or harmed? And hopefully, um, we know Neil will walk us through it because I listened to his, you know, their wonderful uh, seminar already, but um, bring us up to date on that. Will we have better strategies, alternative approaches? And sadly, we still only have 30 days in order to provide input. And as you all know, we've been scrambling going through it. So what we wanted to do was have this webinar series, bring people together. Let's see if we can come to some better common understandings. And even as we're submitting, make sure that we're able to provide some strong, you know, suggestions, alternatives to them. Next slide, please. I just wanted to kind of use this as a segue. This darling, darling child, as you will see, is a little boy in Edmonton, name is Casey. He's almost two years old. And the almost two years old is a really important uh, um, in, bit of information because he has spinal muscular atrophy. There's a new therapy for SMA, which is, uh, trying to get into Canada. It's available in the US, it's being, made, uh, being submitted also in Europe. It is a gene therapy. It will be the first gene therapy to actually be submitted into Canada. Um, the challenge on this gene therapy is that the child has to be under two years old to be able to get access to it. That's the way the licensing requirement works. And what we're looking at right now is the possibility this child turns two in July 17th. The company is just submitting the uh, drug into Health Canada. We've heard that they've actually got it approved last Friday. They're on an expedited review. They will do the submission to CATO simultaneously. We're hoping that we will be able to move this as fast as possible. But no matter how fast we work, we're not going to save this baby unless we can get some extraordinary help. And what we're pleading for is extraordinary help from Alberta Health Services. Because the baby has also been entered into the Global Compassionate Access Program, so he has two chances that he might get it through the Global Access Program, which would be wonderful. But if he doesn't, which is, you know, could be very strongly the case, the only way that we can get access for him is to bypass the regular route that we've got here, is to be able to, he's got an SAP approval, so if we can get, you know, the government to step forward and say yes in advance of the agreement in terms of what, how we're going to pay for this therapy, we are willing to front the support in order for him to get access. You know, this child will not have a chance to get that. He's got everything set up for him. He's got a doctor. He's got a clinic. He's got the approval from Health Canada to bring in the therapy. We're trying desperately to get access. And this is again one of those cases that we say falls very much into the cracks. And quite frankly, Novartis, the company bringing in the drug, I mean, they're really faced with some really severe challenges if in fact they bring the drug in based on the current PR and PRV guidelines as to what that might be in terms of the pricing here relative to the global pricing. And I asked them, I said, you know, are you still bringing in the drug? And they said, yes, we're gonna continue to do it. We have to do it now, we've made the commitment. I said, well, what are you gonna do about pricing? They said, we'll just have to take that chance because it's too important. We've got to get this therapy in. We have a dozen children that are really up against that deadline. So we have to move fast. So this is kind of the example of what are we trying to do here? Can we save this baby? And you know, are there ways that we can work as alternatives to what we have as a really rigid process to make sure that children, adults that are in need are able to get access when they need it? 
So I'll end it there and turn it over to Neil, who can give us the updates in terms of the revised guidelines. Neil, you coming Thanks, up? Uh, there you go. Yeah, I'm there. Thanks, Torhan. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, I have, I've been told I have 12 minutes, so I will uh, do my best to respect that. I have a few slides to work through. And if you can uh, flip to the next one, Bill. Thank you. So just a brief history. In fact, the, 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 the whole process probably started back in 2016 when PMPRB started uh, consulting on potential changes to the PMPRB. In August of 29, uh, 2019, the, uh, the amended regulations were published uh, in Canada Gazette. And, and sort of fast forward to where we are today, we had uh, earlier this month the, uh, uh, the, the, the amended amended regulations deferring implementation to uh, January 2021. And then following that, uh, uh, last week, the draft guidelines published for the 30-day consultation period. So everything's coming into force in January 2021. Uh, and there's, a, you know, I think there's also uh, going to be some tr transition measures. The final guidelines, which will be informed by uh, by the consultation process we're going through now, uh, will come out in the fall. Next slide, please. So, uh, for those of you familiar with the last set of regulatory changes, really not much changed other than the implementation date. So. Uh, we still have PMPRB 11 countries instead of the current PMPRB 7. The makeup of those countries has not changed. Uh, there are new excessive price factors, including uh, cost effectiveness, market size, and uh, uh, per capita GDP, which is really just used as a, a criterion for, uh, uh, for the cost effectiveness threshold. Uh, the reporting requirements, the reporting confidential rebates to provinces and other third-party payers, the PNPRB 11 uh, reference countries, there's also requirements to provide uh, estimates of market size, etc. None of that has changed. Uh, there are some of the, the reductions that were there before uh, continue on, uh, including the breakdown of sales of class uh, by class of customer and, and patented generics. Next slide, please. So what has changed is the guidelines and the draft guidelines. So on the left, we have the 2019 draft guidelines, uh, which were, uh, despite that smaller schematic, uh, were complex enough uh, and, and opaque enough that it was difficult to work through some of the formula uh, uh, formula that, that they had put in place. Uh, when we go over to the right side of this slide, you can see the 2020, 2020 schematic of the draft guidelines, far more complex. And there's, uh, as we work through it, and, and we spent a good deal of time on the weekend trying to sort our way through uh, these guidelines, particularly the application of the economic factors. Uh, the, the, the formula for pharmacoeconomics that was in the 2019 uh, guidelines has been taken out of the 2020 guidelines. That's not to say they're not going to apply a formula, they're just not telling us what it is. We expect it's likely the same sort of formula, uh, which is reliant on CADA producing certain. Uh, uh, pieces of information that can be plugged into the formula, where that's at, we don't know. And and so uh, this is this is you know an area of concern that continues. Uh, the other area is on the market size adjustment. They have included formulas for this, uh, but these formulas uh, are are difficult to sort out. There's no explanation. And to uh, uh, to uh, Durhan's uh, point earlier on, there are no case studies. There's no examples. There's nothing to try and verify. Uh, what what's in these draft guidelines uh, with with reality when we try and plug in actual numbers for actual uh, uh, patented medicines to try and see what the impact is. So there's a long way to go from that perspective to, to truly understand uh, the the impact product by product. And uh, so there's the overall impact and 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 that will have changed. And I'll get to that in the next slide in a minute. Uh, we'll we'll have, likely improve somewhat but the, the where the rubber hits the road is on product by product and it's difficult from what we have right now to really apply either the pharmacoeconomics or the market size adjustment for what are called category one medicines category one being that would include uh, um, most drugs for rare diseases specialty drugs oncology drugs uh, to to really understand the impact because the formula and the methodologies that they're proposing are quite opaque and, and so we need a lot more detail uh, to truly understand what's happened. Next slide, please. So 
to be fair, there's some improvements. Uh, one of the complaints was that the prices of existing medicines, all the existing medicines on the market, were going to be forced down to the median international price from and, the, and, and of the PMPRB 11, not just the PMPRB 7 countries, so the new countries. That has, that has now changed. They're now going to be able to maintain the lower of their current prices or the highest price in the PMPRB 11. Some prices will still have to be reduced, but that's, you know, I think that's uh, uh, an improvement and that's certainly an improvement for, for manufacturers that have products on the market. Uh, gap medicines, those are uh, medicines that came on the market after the publication of the regulations and have a sale before the implementation of the new regulations and guidelines. And they've made an improvement there uh, in the sense that the list, they, they will still be reviewed against the current uh, PMPRB guidelines and then will transition to no higher than that, uh, the, the median international price set by the PMPRB 11. So that's an improvement. Uh, there's some caveats to this, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, so the category one, which I was referring to earlier, which is going to affect uh, high-cost drugs, in other words, drugs with a, a high annual cost uh, of treatment cost, as well as high market size drugs, uh, only, uh, only those medicines are going to be categorized and assessed against the new economic factors. And so category one criteria have been revised. As such that fewer products should fall in there. Currently, our analysis was showing before that about half of products would fall into this category one, which would be the subject to these new economic factors. PMPRB is claiming that number is now closer to 25%. And, and it, I mean, it would look like, based on the, the changes in the criteria for what is a category one medicine, that there's certainly going to be a, a good reduction in that. In part, you know, the market size threshold has been right, raised from $25 million a year in revenues to 50 million, so that's quite a jump. The high cost threshold, um, the high cost drug threshold has been raised from 50% to 150% per capita of GDP, which works out to about uh, $90,000 per year uh, treatment cost up from 30,000 before. So that's a significant change, and that should remove a good number of products. Now, if we think about drugs for rare diseases, Many of those fall, uh, you know, uh, well above a ninety thousand dollar per year threshold, and will still be subject to the uh, the new economic factors. One of the big critiques of the previous draft of the of the guidelines was that uh, that there was no clinical evidence being considered at all. And so one thing they've done is they've reinstated a, a uh, um, an assessment of the clinical benefit um, or level of therapeutic improvement, which they now call the therapeutic criteria level. And that will inform how much the prices to one of the factors that informs how much of a rebate needs to come off of uh, off of the lead, uh, off the list price with drugs that offer greatest therapeutic benefit having to offer the, the, the lower a relatively lower amount of rebates. Um, so those are just some of the examples. There's some other improvements as well, but that's examples of some of the improvements. And, and I think based on some of those improvements, some manufacturers may be able to say, well. If, if this is what's happening for my drug or drugs that are, that are going to be affected, I may be able to go to market now. But there's still a large proportion of, of, of drugs, and I would suggest that many of those are rare disease drugs, um, that there's sufficient uncertainty or sufficient concern with the way these will be applied that the commercial viability is still in question. So let's talk a little bit about the concerns. One big concern and one big caveat we've been flagging to manufacturers is that the new paragraphs 94, 96, 97 um, allow PMPRB staff to all arbitrarily modify price tests and the price excessive price thresholds when products are subject to an investigation. Now, investigations can be commenced if the, the uh, manufacturer's price appears, uh, not, de not as determined to be, but appears to be uh, above uh, the guidelines, what the guidelines would allow, or they receive a complaint. And a complaint, does not need to be supported by evidence. It can be filed uh, by anyone at any time, and that will start an investigation, and that gives the PMPRB staff under this current proposed provisions in 94 and 96 of the guidelines free reign to do whatever they want uh, by modifying price tests and price thresholds. This is something that needs to be changed. Manufacturers need to have certainty. The makeup of the PMPRB 11 continues to exclude the US and Switzerland, and speaking of the US, we, you know, I had a call earlier this morning uh, with a manufacturer who, who was facing an uphill battle convincing their U.S. counterpart, their U.S. Uh, 
uh, the counterpart that that it's okay to launch in Canada if the U.S. is not one of the reference countries. They think it's important that the U.S. be in there, and so this is this is, continues to be concerned. Now, this is a regulations question, not a guidelines question, but it's a continuing concern. Um, the relevant indication is based on patient population. So by relevant indication, this is the indication that PMPRB will be relying on uh, to uh, apply its excessive, uh, apply the pharmacoeconomic factor and to do therapeutic class comparison tests. It's based on the size of the patient population, but not, the not necessarily the indication that offers the greatest therapeutic benefit. So think of a cancer drug which comes on the market and the uh, uh, it's approved both in first and second line. In the first line, there may be several drugs, and, and the new drug provides a marginal benefit compared to the uh, uh, the existing drugs. But as for for patients that don't don't respond to those existing drugs, this new drug is a tremendous advance. Well, PMPRB will likely be looking at the at the at the at the indication and only at the indication uh, where based on market size, which would be a lot larger, rather than looking at the one that offers the greatest therapeutic benefit. And this is going to be in, in, in conflict with what uh, PCPA and the provinces and everyone else will be looking at. And so PMPRB could be setting a, a price based on, uh, on an indication that's never going to be reimbursed. And let's move ahead quickly because I can see my time is moving quickly and Bill's going to give me the hook. Um, so there can be arbitrary reductions of 50% to rebated prices in some cases. Uh, I mentioned the formularies are opaque, no study. So there's tremendous uncertainty. Next slide, Bill. So what's the impact of patient access and patient support programs? So the continued uncertainty and threat of low prices is gonna to continue to lead to delayed or no launch decisions for innovative drugs in Canada. And I think that's particularly gonna affect drugs for rare diseases. Uh, there's, we've already seen, and there's good evidence that there's a reduction in industry-sponsored clinical trials throughout 2019 and into 2020 as a result of the, the amended regulations. So manufacturers are holding back on clinical trials, and if they hold back on clinical trials, they're holding back on launches as well. And then finally, when you look at the patient support programs, if they're not doing clinical trials and they're not going to be launching in Canada, uh, and, and, and add to that the reduced revenues they're going to get from, uh, uh, from these rebated prices, it's going to be much more difficult to, to fund these uh, patient support programs. And, and I, won't, I won't read all the, the, uh, the details there, but that's going to continue to be a major challenge for, for manufacturers. I'll leave it at that. Thanks so much, Neil. And uh, um, this is the, when we're going to turn it over to, uh, to the panel. And I'd love, love, love to kick it off with, um, with Stephanie. I mean, you and the, the CF Get Loud crew, I mean, how do you react to what, what you heard from, from Durhan uh, and, and Neil? Is this... I mean, you've been trying to navigate this now for, for, for months. Did, did any of that shed some light on it for you? And, and maybe just tell us about your, your personal experience, how you got into this, and are you starting to get it now? And what can you do about that? Yeah, we've been keeping a close eye on this. And every time we think we understand it, uh, we see more complexities. Uh, and with these new guidelines, it really seemed to get even more complex. They took a windy road and made it a quagmire, in our opinion. <laughs> Um, we're hoping that there's some fragments of light within this new guidelines that could perhaps lead us to some of the more urgent medications that we need, but there's still so much uncertainty that we don't have a lot of confidence right now, and we still need to work very hard and keep raising our voices, and that's what Get Loud is here to, to do. Uh, I'd like to share my story and just let you know a little bit about why these guidelines are in the hearts and in the minds of all the CF families around Canada. I have a disclaimer for you though. I have to let you know that 2020, um, this is a very unpopular view, but 2020 is one of the best years of my life. And I know not very many people can relate to that, but at the beginning of this year, I was the first CF patient in Canada to be granted compassionate care use for a gene modulator called Trikafta. Uh, this felt like winning the life lottery, and it completely changed my life. Uh, this year has been a stark contrast compared to previous years with CF, especially last year. Uh, last year, I had a pneumonia that was ravaging my body and was unrelenting, and it was absolutely terrifying. It took everything away from me. 
CF has always been a big impact in my life, but really since hitting my 30s, it's taken away my ability to see the world, uh, to have, it took away my career, it took away my ability to grow my family and to just be a parent the way I want to parent. Uh, at one point last year, I had a terrifying moment where I had extreme hemoptysis and my lungs filled with so much blood that they were unable to stop it. And we were worried this episode was going to end my life. Lying in the hospital, um, the, the mental health and the physical health were so intense. I couldn't walk. At times I would break down mentally just because having a conversation with my four-year-old was so exhausting uh, because I couldn't breathe. It was just It was just too much to handle. It got to the point that St. Michael's Hospital sent me to Toronto General for assessment to have my lungs transplanted, to do a level, double lung transplant. It was really looking as if these lungs that I currently have, are they're done. They're absolutely just spent. Then we get to fall of 2019. And this medicine that we've sort of been keeping our eyes on, Trikafta, was approved by the FDA in the States. And where I was at in my life, you know, I felt like I was falling without a parachute. All of a sudden I felt maybe there's hope here. You know, this is, this is a breakthrough that the CF community has been waiting for. In 1989, sick kids identified the gene, they isolated the gene, the defective gene that causes cystic fibrosis. So since I've been six years old, every birthday cake, every, every as cheesy as it is every shooting star I'm, i wanted a cure and we've been talking about the cure is so close and we've been waiting for a breakthrough medicine and here we are fall of 2019 they released this medicine that the trials were so magnificent i saw my cf friends in the states go from my position being evaluated for a lung transplant to then thriving and getting their lives back, going back to their careers, having families. And here we are in Canada watching this all happen. And I truly thought in my heart that, well, it's just a, it's just a, a matter of dotting the, I, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. This is Canada. In the CF community, Canada has the longest life expectancy. It's a good place to live with CF. So I was very blown away to find out all the roadblocks that we have in place to get precision, innovative medicine into our country. It really, it really shook up everything I had known as a Canadian with CF. Um, I was determined to get this medicine. I, I was not taking no for an answer. So the minute that I thought, you know, perhaps if the compassionate care program comes to Canada like they did for other medicines, I knew I was going to be on this program. So I campaigned very hard to get this medicine. I, you know, met with members of parliament. I wrote every newspaper. I, I contacted every national news outlet. I felt like I just needed to scream to the rooftops that this breakthrough is here and it's just south of the border and, and how unjust that was. So as my health continued to spiral during this fight, uh, finally I had an appointment at St. Michael's Hospital. It was actually the worst appointment I've had to date in terms of my lung function. I saw numbers that just really confirmed that these lungs were done. But during that appointment at the end, the pharmacist came in and he said, Steph, the hard work's paid off and you're gonna be the first in Canada to get Trikafta. You're gonna get on the compassionate care program. And I burst into tears and I, I just felt like, like I said, I won the lottery. And within 48 hours within taking this medicine, my whole life turned around. Uh, it, was, it, was an, it was an incredible recovery just within a couple of days and I'm still recovering now. But when they gave me the medicine, they said, Stephanie, can you mark some goals down of things that you want to be able to achieve through this new opportunity? And my goal was to bathe myself because at the time I simply couldn't. The week before, twice, my mom and my husband had to carry me off the bathroom floor um, and to dance with my son. I have a four-year-old that loves to dance, but picking him up was just not possible. Within, within 24 hours of taking the drug, I was able to stand up and walk around without oxygen. Within 48 hours of taking the drug, I was able to lift up my son and bathe myself. And every week after that, I've just seen massive strides. 
And genuinely, if I close my eyes and I take a big deep breath in, I feel like I've had a lung transplant. So to get to the feeling that, you know, we I was going down this road of needing these new lungs. And now with this precision medicine that's not available here, I have the ability to take a deep, giant breath. And I genuinely, when I do, it brings me to tears. One, because I'm so proud that we're at this moment in the CF community where we have where we have this breakthrough medicine, but it brings me so much pain to know that you have to get to the point that you're at end of life to receive this medicine. I know what the last decade of life has been like for me and the trauma that you go through when you're near the end of life with CF. To think that these future children um, would go through this when this medicine is just south of the border is something that the CF community is not willing to put up with. So when I first took my, my first dose of Trikafta, the news team that was following my story came to my house in this family room here and they watched as I took the first two pills. They watched my family embrace and my four-year-old saying, mama, no more IVs, you're gonna be home and not at the hospital. And this moment, you know, it went viral within the CF community. And I had patients reaching out for me to me from all across Canada saying, they're congratulating me. Some people were saying, well, why you? Why not me? I got stories, um, especially out of Nova Scotia, where there's a particular patient that was doing very poorly that was younger than me. And everyone said, well, she needs this drug. How can we get it to her? And I started talking with my friends, uh, my close friends in the CF community. And I said, listen, this is overwhelming. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just starting to be able to walk with oxygen. I'm just trying to get my life back. And I'm getting these messages come in about people's family members on ventilators asking me to help them. And I don't have that power. But what we do have within the CF community is, is just the power of that community and the power of sharing stories and lifting each other up. So my friends within the CF community, they said, Steph, let's divide and conquer. We'll just, we started out with a simple email address and said, let's take all those messages of concern, reply to every one of them, but arm them with information and help share everyone's stories. So that's how the Get Loud Canada team formed with just a few patients on IV poles, equally fighting for their lives. And our goal is to empower every patient to get loud, raise their voices, to learn about everything, including these guidelines and how they impact us and to stand up for this community and let them know that we will be heard. And as we saw in the background or they mentioned the CF community. We were absolutely heard. So as long as we can, we can keep going on this path and keep inspiring others to make change, I feel like we, we will make a difference. I genuinely feel like we're going to get to a place where CF patients will be able to be prescribed medicine that will not just save their life, but give them a quality of life that's far superior to what we know of CF today and let them live a long, healthy, wonderful life. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was a wonderful story, and, and the fact that you're you're using, you know, your your lottery winnings to actually help other people get access to, and 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 to be able to breathe and and, and live long lives. That's amazing. Um, J Jason, over to you. One thing Stephanie mentioned was like the, the gene was discovered in Toronto in 1989 that could potentially help this. You're you're a bench scientist uh, by profession. You you work within the Ontario government. Now you you you're a leader within the sector in in Ontario. You know what do you think about about the, uh, you know the guidelines and and how it matches up with Stephanie's story? Um, and what are you seeing in terms of of you know your members and the people in the in the sector uh, you might have even have some new data to share today so over to you jason yeah sure bill um and and thank you stephanie uh, for sharing your story i think it's really important um because all of us that work in this industry whether at a not-for-profit like i do or or at these individual companies or or the scientists you know working in the research labs it all comes down to that story right um it's it's about helping people it's about helping patients that's uh that's what gets us up and motivates all of us every day, day in, day out. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that. Um, you know, 
Maybe hearing uh, the the descriptor that Neil uh, gave in terms of of uh, of the revised um, uh, guidelines that, that were published, you know, I'm I'm thinking of the analogy of building a canoe out of a bunch of sticks and then expecting it to float. And when you find out that it leaks, you wrap it in duct tape uh, to fix the leaks. And that's exactly what we have here: um, a canoe made out of sticks wrapped in duct tape. Instead of taking a step back and designing a proper boat that floats, has the capacity you need, and does what you need it to do. And so this idea and concept of alternative approaches really needs to, um, to be thought of, thought through properly, uh, rather than these band-aid fixes that are being uh, suggested. This is really important, particularly given the data that we just released um, through um, a study that we commissioned IQVIA um, to really look at uh, global launch data. So one of the things that we've been uh, concerned from the beginning of this entire PMPRB uh, modernization process is what the impacts are going to be, uh, not just to uh, companies and and, uh, and 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 also to sort of the overall innovation ecosystem, but for patients and timely access to medicines. And so we wanted to look at that data to see how does Canada follow uh, global launch trends. And have we seen any any red flags that have been raised over the last few years? And, and the short answer is yes. Uh, we've actually seen that over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, Canada's launch time has gradually improved globally. That's good news for Canadians. Um, but over the last couple of years, uh, we've seen a drastic divergence uh, from the global data uh, that we've been following uh, relatively closely uh, historically. And, you know, just to give you an example, in 2019, we saw a 40% drop. Um, and since 2018, you know, there's always a bit of a delay in terms of Canadian launches, but of 37 medicines um, that, that were launched in 2018 globally, uh, so far we've only seen 16 of those medicines. And this is the most drastic divergence uh, that we've seen. And so this is a red flag. This is um, real data that substantiates the concerns that we have had um, that, that access to new medicines are, are, are gonna be a real impact um, from PMPRB. The other thing that this study does, um, which I think is a really important element, and it was touched on here, but I want to dig into this a little bit because, um, you know, Doug Clark from the PMPRB wrote an article in, in the Hill Times recently, and once again, you know, um, reaffirmed the PMPRB's position that, you know, prices don't matter. They're not going to impact launches, they're not going to impact investments and so forth. Well, you know, Common sense aside, we all know prices matter. Um, but putting common sense aside, uh, one of the some of the data that we gathered as part of this report showcased a scatter plot of jurisdictions across the world and where they sit in terms of, of launches. And what it shows us is that um, it's not all about pricing, uh, but prices do matter. But it's a complicated set of parameters that companies have to weigh, um, including market size, including pricing, but also a big factor is predictability. So while the PMPRB likes to point to the US on, on being as an outlier in terms of prices, you know, we can also see on that scatter plot a, a country like China, which has a massive market, yet lags in launch time because of the unpredictable, unpredictability and uncertainty um, built into that market. So all of these factors have to be taken into consideration when we're talking about uh, launch times. And the one thing that's certain is that the new revised guidelines that were published only add more uncertainty uh, to, to the equation. And so this is not going to help uh, access to new medicines and the timeliness of launch. Couple that with the sharp reduction in pricing, you've got two out of the three main par parameters there taking a huge hit, and we're already a small market. So it, it puts us in a bad situation. Thank, thanks very much, Jason. Um, and feel free to start jumping in. This yeah. should, but we haven't heard from Bennett, but go ahead, Jarhan. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up because what you said is so important, Jason, and also I think very briefly, as you say, the comment in the Hill Times about um, 
the fact that no, there's no evidence that we've actually taken a hit in clinical trials. And then unfortunately, you know, what Doug was citing was the fact that we have a whole host of, you know, phase one clinical trials, which are trials with healthy patients, but he doesn't really address what is critical to us in bringing in those trials early. The other thing, and that's how I'll toss it back to Stephanie, maybe to make a quick comment, and hopefully Bennett will be able to kind of come back to us, is, you know, do you see these revised guidelines actually addressing, you know, the situation around Trikafta? I mean, I read the revised guidelines and, you know, and uh, PDCI's, uh, you know, review hoods as well as others, and then went back to the background, which came out after the fact. I will have to say, I don't know who wrote that backgrounder, but obviously it was somebody that had a really good degree in, degree in literature because it was written very nicely. It was full of compassion. It kind of said, here's what we heard and here's kind of how we we're going to respond. If you read that background, you think like, oh boy, they really heard us and they're going to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And then you go into, and here's what we're going to do. And you realize, no, what you've given us, as you say, is really good duct tape. I love that analogy. You know, it's really colorful duct tape. It's, you know, but I mean, the, the long and short of it is based on the revised guideline, Trikafta is no more likely to be submitted quickly than it was before. And certainly my fear is that, you know, be, because we've got Novartis who's willing to say, okay, we're going to bring Zogensma in come hell or high water um, under the guidelines, it offers them no more security and no more benefits in terms of the pricing than it did under the original set. So I don't know, Stephanie, whether your reading of it was sort of similar to mine. Yeah, it's been a roller coaster. Um, when we first read the guidelines, we really thought, are they trying to say, are they trying to make a point here to try to get Trikafta in? Are we being that loud? Uh, and we are, you know, as as you've read them, there's a lot to pour through. We're going over, we're having endless meetings about it. And then we read that backgrounder. And like I said, we specifically got a shout out saying, you know, we've heard the CF community. And for us, for a moment, that was validation saying, yeah, you did. You know, we, we've really made ourselves clear that this is what we need. But as we started digging into it, we realized that it is so complex and it's, you know, if there is a positive note, it looks like it's very unclear and uncertain if there is something. It wasn't a hard, absolutely not, absolutely no. But the biggest thing we're seeing here is there's no action going to be taken on behalf of the manufacturer that we need uh, to submit. You know, Vertex needs to submit to Health Canada. But from what we're looking at, there's so much uncertainty here and some vague writing that talks, uh, like like you say, it's policing in a way that how could a manufacturer submit at this point until the final guidelines are released and in the cf community you know we cannot wait for this we lose 50 to 60 young lives median age of 30 each year in canada so really what how many lives are we willing to lose waiting for them to get this right okay. Bennett, uh, any yeah, any anything to you know? You've had long experience as uh, you know the head of market access at varying companies. Now you're at, at Sanofi, you know, doing everything from rare disorders to to vaccines and other things for COVID, which has got to be exciting place to be. What, what, what do you see in all this? Yeah, so uh, first I just want to thank Stephanie for telling her story and just really minds all of us, you know why we're doing what we're doing and as a market access professional you know my job is to bring innovative products here in Canada and you know could we I thank you for your bravery and continue to, to tell your story um, and with respect to to the guidelines and when I look at the guidelines and I think you know Neil has described it very well the, the guidelines certainly has improved from the draft guidelines from the previous draft uh, as it relates to grandfather products and GAP products. Um, so if, if you have a drug on the market between now and January of 2021, it's not too bad because pharmacoeconomic factors are not going to be applied. It's the new innovative products beyond January 2021 where there still remains a high level of uncertainty. And as a, a Canadian affiliate, we have to make a business case to our global uh, headquarters as well to to make a case that Canada is still a good place to to bring products to invest to have clinical trials you know as as Canadians working in the Canadian affiliate we want to have the best healthcare system here in Canada we want to have uh, uh, options for innovative drug therapy 
and the guidelines going forward for new drugs in particular for rare disease products because they are automatically you know pretty much classified as high cost drugs uh, they, they're, you get double dinged in, in a certain way so not only do you have to uh, abide to a, an arbitrary price reduction in terms of a rebated price but if you exceed a certain um, market size threshold then you you have you there's another algorithm involved in reducing that those those revenues so so, so it's too bad that you can treat more individuals you know you'll have to you know you'll have to be penalized for that um, so so that's you know that's a high level of uncertainty and so when we try and make that business case to our global colleagues about the Canadian environment how we need to continue to invest here in Canada how we can have clinical trials when they look at the the environment it's it's going to be challenging and it's the pharmacoeconomic factors that we have no over control over because those factors uh the cost effectiveness it's all calculated by by Kadath and Nice and and they have to do their job to critique the the models that, that um, uh, manufacturers put forward but obviously they're looking at it from a worst case scenario so those cost per quality numbers are, are never going to be favorable they're going to be very high and we have no control over that and so as we plan out even a year from now for products we want to bring to Canada we don't know how Kadath and Nice are going to assess those products in the past prior to the PMPRP guidelines we could take those numbers we could take the assessment at least have a discussion and dialogue with the payers and PCPA you know recognize the the longer time horizon for our drugs the potential benefit for our, our therapies what does the circuit marker say and so we can have those uh, dialogues and conversation conversations to arrive at some sort of agreement right now right out of the gates from PMPRB as they set these price thresholds uh, we don't have that chance for our dialogue and so there still remains a high level of uncertainty and and again you know therapeutic criteria level that that is going to be assessed by board staff at PMPRB. You know, we, we know for vast majority of drugs that go through, even rare disease products, they don't classify them as breakthrough. And so when, when they classify them as a slight or no improvement or a lower therapeutic level, then there's a greater penalty associated with it. So I'm, I'm concerned about the future of innovative medicines in particular, and in, in, in particular rare disease products. Thanks so much, Durhan. I mean, we're we're coming up on on the hour, um, and this has been a great, you know, discussion. And thank you all for for contributing. Um, do you want to just introduce the ne the next couple webinars? Uh, we have got a couple of questions in, but nothing that that the that the panelists haven't actually covered. So um, maybe I, I'll sort of turn it back to you to to talk about about them and any final thoughts that you've heard from the panelists and and where you want to go next. Well, I wish we had another hour or so for this panel because this is amazing. Um, the good news is that we do have another panel coming up and that will happen, um, you know, in on July 9th. What we wanted to do is that July 8th will be the public forum. So, you know, that will be held um, quite sadly, you know, I mean, I really feel for what Neil was saying earlier, you know, and what how Bennett put together, you know, are your staff the right staff within the PMPRB to be doing that kind of assessment and to be able to come out with a legally binding number? Because it is a negotiated process. It's a negotiated process everywhere. And that's how and that's how the patient impact gets in. You cannot distill the patient impact. You cannot take Stephanie's experience and say, can I put a number on it and can you put it into your formula and off you go. And I think that's the challenge we've got with what's in front of us. What we wanted to do then is that uh, hopefully a lot of people will participate in the public forum on the July 8th that PMPRB is hosting. We were very saddened to hear that the format actually isn't going to be an actual consultation. You may write questions in ahead of time, but there will be no Q&A during the forum. So I guess nobody wants to be caught flat-footed in terms of having a question put in front of them that they're actually going to have to answer sensibly to. That's me being very snide about the whole thing. But that's not being unrealistic because we've been in those forums already. So I've had lots of experiences in terms of being in those forums, and I'm very, very sad that they didn't do the forum that they had planned, and that is allowing people to come and speak directly to their board, uh, which seems to have been scrapped now in terms of uh, the favor of a public forum. 
And despite the fact that they say they've held all of these one-on-one -on -one meetings, I've been in those one-on-one -on -one meetings. Those were not consultations. Those were not negotiations. Those were not an ability to say, here's my perspective. Geez, what can you do in order to address it? And that's been the sad part about this all along. And again, I go back to the backgrounder. The first part of it sounds good, as Stephanie says. Hey, they quoted us. They recognize it. And then you read the follow-up to it and it says, no, you didn't address the problem that I raised to you. You know, you went and said, great, pro great, great question. You've got that great concern. Now let me just do this instead. So we are still very challenged about it. And we're still convinced more than ever that this ability to actually make those legally binding kinds of, you know, PE decisions should not be in the hands of the PMPRB and certainly not under the revised guidelines. So we're not happy with where they sit, but we want to have them a forum that will be on July 9th. And hopefully we will be able to bring people back together. Um, and so, you know, hopefully none of you have filled up July 9th at 1 p.m., but you will be with us. And then what we wanted to do then is recognizing we only had 30 days is to bring people back together again and maybe a different, you know, cast to really talk about what you think you're going to say. Where's your, where are you sitting now after, you know, 20 some days with these? Can we share that? Can we talk about it? Maybe we, could, we can definitely learn from each other in terms of what we are responding to, same as here. So we've got uh, two more webinars that we want to be able to bring forth. We'll have it probably still, as again, as a roundtable discussion. And um, hopefully, you know, we can get some reason into what, um, you, you know, looks like a very shaky uh, vessel that we've got here. I don't know, Jason, I ain't getting into that vessel. But unfortunately, it's the only ferry that goes to the other side. This is the sad part, right? So, and I'm not even that good a swimmer for God's sake. So this is very, very, very scary. Um, so appreciate very much everybody what you've done and Neil, especially to your group for working hard over that weekend to come up with the uh, kinds of analysis we had and we know you're gonna be doing more of it. So thank you folks very much for being here. Um, and uh, certainly thanks to our entire panel for your very thoughtful comments. I wish we'd had a whole lot more time. And Bill, again, always thanks to you for, for masterful moderating. I'm, uh, you know, Bill says, you can get somebody else you want. I said, God, no, we got the master already. Hate to change yeah. forces in midstream on this one. So appreciate it very much in terms of what you do for us. In my, it's my honor, uh, more than even pleasure. And, and you know, um, if people can stick around just for two seconds, I want to clarify that the middle webinar is not the PMPRB's webinar. They're going to be doing a public webinar on July 8th. The one that CORD is going to be hosting on July 9th is going to be uh, an opportunity for, for CORD to invite them to come uh, and engage with everyone who's on this, on this webinar and, and, and hear directly. And it'll be a chance for, uh, you know, the, the, another roundtable like this to have a discussion about what the PMPRB has presented the day before. So that's the other reason it's, uh, it's, it's happening on the 9th. The, the, um, the other webinar will be on the 8th. Um, one of the questioners also wanted to know, you know, what are what does CORD want to see in terms of changes? Um, and that's, you know, we're that's under development. There are some recommendations that we showed earlier in the in the slide deck, and so you'll be able to see that on on SlideShare. Um, but it's actually come forward, and, and Stephanie, I know you've been active on on the question board as well, just saying, look, why don't you just do the countries and don't over medicate the patient by adding uh, the economic factors. Uh, at the same time, why are we going for the, this grand slam when we should we should do things one at a, once at one at a time? So that's one one thing the court has been really strident about um, in terms of its submissions, um, and that was actually mentioned earlier in 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 the deck as well. But to be to be really honest, um, what it's been five days, Neil, since we we've actually had these these guidelines. Um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to to understand them and unpack them. Uh, we've got 30 days to do that and having webinars like this and, and everyone asking the right questions online, um, incredible panelists sharing their own stories um, and the data that they're bringing forward and analogies like uh, canoes made of duct tape and, and sticks. Um, it, you know, we can't thank you enough. It's, you know, let's, I, I'm going to stay the heck out of that canoe, Jason. Um, I'm, I don't think that all six of us could, could fit in it. So let's use these webinars to, hopefully put Canada on path to build a, a new blue nose that can actually get out there that we can be proud of. Um, I want to, I want to see Canadians be as proud of the stuff that comes out of Canada. Like that, that, you know, the gene that we discovered in 1989, 
you know, we look up in the air and we say, that's Bombardier's plane flying. I want people to say, you know, that's a Canadian innovation that's, that's being um, uh, put into somebody that's going to save their life. So, I don't know, that's, if I'm allowed a little bit of a, a wish, um, it's for us to build, a, you know, something in, in Canada that, that we can be proud of um, and not a canoe made of sticks and, and duct tape. So, anyway, thank you all. We'll see you again on July 9th. Come on to the other webinars and, and, and opportunities that, that are, that are going to be um, helping educate people so that your great questions can come forward again on the 9th. So we'll, we'll see you then. Don't be shy to stay in touch in the meantime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.